Hey, this is Colt Boom Boom Cabana. You're watching Wrestling with Regret. I'm sorry? Despite what many of you might think, in no way do I relish in piling on WCW, at least no more than anything else I talk about in this show. Looking back, it's really depressing that there's this big institution with its roots going back decades that would eventually be bought out and discarded so soon after I became a wrestling fan. I wasn't able to appreciate what we all had back then, and part of me wishes I'd become a wrestling fan sooner because of it. But that being said, come on. We can all agree that 2000 was a pretty big shit show, right? It's really hard to look back positively on the final calendar year of WCW's existence. Through a combination of bad writing, bad management, and bad luck, virtually everything that could have gone wrong in WCW at that time did. Anything that could have been received negatively by fans and critics was. They threw everything they could at the wall to see what stuck, but nothing ever did. The biggest sign of just how chaotic things were in the company was its world championship. In one year, there were so many title changes and controversies surrounding the big gold belt, it'll make your head spin. And this week on Wrestling with Regret, we're going on the roller coaster ride that was the WCW Championship in the year 2000. The year began strongly enough with Bret Hart as champion. His time in the main event scene was pretty convoluted though, having given up the title the night after Starcade in December, then winning it back the same night and forming the NWO Silver and Black. But before that angle could pick up any steam, the Hitman was forced to relinquish the title again and ultimately retire due to a concussion he suffered at Starcade. Thus began the historic, career-defining year of one of the all-time greats. Yes, he'd been around for a long time before this, winning titles along the way, but this was undoubtedly his best year to date. Ladies and gentlemen, Vacant. Let me tell you something, brother. I'm the greatest wrestler there's ever been. I've lived for more than a century, picking up championships everywhere I've been on every conceivable level. John Cena, Ric Flair, Jerry Lawler, Triple H, they ain't got shit on Vacant, daddy. But Vacant didn't hold on to the 15 pounds of gold for long, as Chris Benoit beat Sid Vicious at the sold-out pay-per-view to become the new champion. Benoit winning the championship was a ploy by WCW management to get him to stay with the company, since the crippler was at odds with Kevin Sullivan, who had been booking for the company in Vince Russo's absence. That ploy failed, and Benoit forfeited the title and left for the WWF after only one day as champion. Oh yeah! Too bad, so sad, Benoit. Hate to see you leave. Just means more gold for the man without a face. With Benoit out of the picture, this led to a feud between Sid Vicious and Commissioner Kevin Nash, where about a year's worth of television was crammed into about a month. On the January 24th edition of Nitro, Sid earned the chance to fight Nash for the vacant title by defeating the Harris brothers, and went on to beat Nash later in the night to become the champion. He didn't hold on to the belt for long, though, as Nash stripped him of the belt on Thunder. Apparently, his qualifying match was thrown out because he pinned the wrong Harris twin. Woohoo! Give it up for technicalities, baby! The vacant age is back in action! Don't get too excited, Nash immediately gave the belt to himself. Damn it. Then immediately dropped it back to Sid that night in a triple threat cage match alongside Ron Harris. After that clusterfuck of title swapping, Sid would go on to hold the belt for a whopping 76 days, one of the longest reigns of the entire year. In the midst of this reign, Sid had turned heel after attacking Hulk Hogan, incensed that people would cheer the Hulkster's name over his. Uh, really? You're surprised that people don't all want to get behind the guy who said this? But you only half the man that I am, and I have half the brain that you do. But before the feud could culminate in a proper blow-off, Vince Russo returned to the company to resume his stint as head writer alongside Eric Bischoff. On April 10th, in their first act back in power, Vinnie Rue and Eazy E vacated all the belts in WCW. Wait, they did what? Yes! All the gold, all the power, I'm gonna live forever! Um, nom, 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 nom. This move was meant to shake up the WCW product, and while it certainly did that, it also cocked up a lot of ongoing storylines, including the Sid Hogan angle, all for the sake of shock value. And speaking of shocking, Bischoff couldn't strip Sid of the belt without sneaking in a super insider comment. Do you hear that, Bischoff? That's the sound of Mark Madden being the only one in the entire arena who got the reference. Six days later at Spring Stampede, Jeff Jarrett won his first world title by defeating Diamond Dallas Page after Kimberly turned on DDP. Jarrett held onto the title for a mammoth eight days before losing it to DDP the next week on Nitro in a cage match that lasted about five minutes. 
Now this time WCW is riding high on the success of their smash hit film, Ready to Rumble. The movie been out for a few weeks and a plan was in the works for some big cross promotion. Enter David Arquette. On the April 26th episode of Thunder, just over a week after DDP won the title, Arquette was held hostage by Jeff Jarrett and Eric Bischoff. They demanded that DDP put his title on the line, but instead of a traditional one-on-one, -on -one, it would be in a tag team match where DDP would partner with his co-star against Jarrett and Bischoff. Whoever scored the pinfall would win the title. Oh, and they meant that, by the way. Anyone who pinned anyone else would become the champion. That's a detail that doesn't normally come up in the finish of a match like this, but oh, it did this time. In a publicity stunt gone bad, they gave the World Championship, once previously held by guys like Ric Flair, Sting, Lex Luger, and Hulk Hogan, to skinny actor man David Arquette. The ratings told the story as they dropped more than half a point from week to week and never fully recovered. And the damnedest thing is, DDP celebrated here with Arquette and that was his title. Why is he happy about this? He just lost his belt and played a role in turning the championship into a joke. Who wrote this crap? Hey bro, don't look at me about that bro, that was not my idea. Let me be perfectly clear, the idea of David Arquette winning the WCW Championship was pitched to me by outside sources, bro. I know Vince, I know. Trust me bro, things are about to get a lot worse. I know Vince, I know. After a David Arquette heel turn that certainly put butts in the seats and drew millions of dollars, Jarrett regained the championship at Slambury in a Ready to Rumble tie-in match. He lost the next week to Ric Flair on an episode of Nitro, only for Vince Russo to strip him of the belt and award it to Jeff Jarrett, who lost it later that week on Thunder to Kevin Nash, who handed it over to Ric Flair on Nitro, who lost it later that night to Jeff Jarrett. That last paragraph all took place in one month, and in case you're keeping score, we are now halfway into the year 2000, and including vacancies, we've had 18 title changes. Haha, <laughs> that's right Jack, forget Sid Vicious, I'm the real Millennium Man. I have 100 times the titles that he has, and I have 100th the brain that he do. You know Vacant, you, you might want to work on that one. Fast forward to Bash the Beach 2000. In the scheduled match between Hulk Hogan and Jeff Jarrett, the Chosen One laid down for Hogan, allowing him to win the title. Vince Russo came out later in the night, cut an infamous shoot promo against the Hulkster, and nullify the title victory. To go into detail as to why this happened would put me on a tangent that's far too complicated for this video, and I'll talk about it one day in the future. Long story short, Jarrett would go on to defend the belt in an actual match against Booker T, who won the gold for the first time in his career. This championship feud between Booker T and Jeff Jarrett seemed to symbolize a real changing of the guard, a statement that the old way of doing things in WCW was no more. It would take some time to restore the belt's prestige, what with all the vacancies, the short championship reigns, and that god-awful run with David Arquette, but with the right people in place, things really had the potential to improve. LOL Kevin Nash Less than two months after Booker's historic victory, Big Sexy defeated Booker for the title on an episode of Nitro. Less than three weeks later, Booker won it back in a caged heat match at the Fall Brawl pay-per-view. Hey Bri, remember when I said things were about to get worse? Well, it's happening, bro. Oh God, already? One week after Booker's victory, the championship was defended in another caged heat match against the one and only Vince Russo, only this time escape rules applied. In the end, Goldberg speared Russo out of the cage as Booker T was heading out the door. No clear winner was declared until later that week on Thunder when- It was me! I did it! I won the WCW Championship, bro! I know, Vince. I know. Excuse me. Between Vince Russo and David Arquette, it's hard to say with certainty which title reign was the worst one. Both of them were harmful to the business, neither got anyone more over than they already were, and both dragged any remaining prestige the title might have had left into the muck. You could argue that Arquette's reign was the better of the two because it was done with the intent of selling you something, and at least it wasn't his call to put the belt on himself. Meanwhile, maybe Russo's was better because it helped further a storyline and Russo was involved in wrestling on a full-time basis. I don't know, can't both these reigns just get the Benoit treatment already? But Russo's reign of tyranny with the title was short-lived, as the following week on the October 2nd edition of Nitro, he vacated the belt. I said, he vacated the belt. <sighs> hey man, what's wrong? Aren't you happy to have the belt again? It's just... Ugh, I don't know, really? I mean, Vince Russo, that's who I won this belt from? It's like... 
I feel like I'm at a crossroads in life. Do I keep going for the fame and the glory and the money, or do I hold on to what little integrity I have left? I'm in a real crisis here. Damn, I feel you, man. That sucks. But hey, you'll be happy to know that Booker T won the belt back the night that Vince gave it to you. Oh, thank God. <laughs> what a relief. So tell me, how did Booker T win the belt? In the, um, San Francisco 49ers match. God damn it! The title changed hands for the final time in 2000 at the Mayhem pay-per-view on November 26th, when Scott Steiner beat Booker T in a straitjacket steel cage match. This was noteworthy because A, it took place in a cell, not a cage, B, Steiner's valet Medasia was allowed to be in the cell with him the entire time, and C, the straitjacket was a pointless gimmick added to the match that was never required to win, as Steiner beat the book with a chair shot and the Steiner recliner. If you include the days he held the title in 2001 up until the final Nitro, Big Papa Pump had the longest reign all year at 120 days. And that was the WCW Championship in the year 2000. Let's break it down. When it was all said and done, the WCW Championship was either vacated or changed hands 25 times in 2000, averaging more than twice a month. That same year, the WWF title changed hands a total of six times, four of which were between two people. In all, only five of the WCW title reigns that year lasted for more than a month, and only two of those for more than two months. One of my biggest problems with all this madness is how often the belt was vacated, a total of six times in 2000 beginning with Bret Hart. It had been vacated plenty of times before that, but never so frequently over a short period of time. The most senseless had to be during the mass stripping of titles on April 10th of that year. It's bad enough when titles are vacated due to an injury, or someone quitting the company, or as part of a convoluted storyline with an authority figure, but when you vacate a title just because, it shows that it has no worth, no meaning, no purpose. And listen, I know that wrestling is a work, and I get the argument that belts are props, but they're the most important props. If you're going to compare championships in wrestling to props on the stage, the world title is the gun, not the glass of water on the table or the picture on the wall. But once Arquette and Russo held the belt, that's how you knew the company was going under. Now, there's no defending when Vincent Mann won his own championships in 1999 and in 2007, but at least the guy worked out. If Deputy Dewey can hold the championship, it no longer feels like as much of an accomplishment when someone like Jeff Jarrett or Booker T wins it. Look, Bri Bro, in my defense, I did what I could, but WCW was a sinking ship at that time, bro. Nothing I could have done could have saved that company, bro. I know, Vince. I know. You're gonna appreciate this one, bro. Have I told you before that if you like Finn Balor, you're gay? All right, bro, that look you're giving me right now, bro, makes me very uncomfortable. I'm gonna have to file a restraining order against you, bro.